My name is Morris Williams, and it is my privilege to welcome you to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I have four requests. One, turn off your cell phones, any other recording device that you might have. Two, write a check to support the Free Library of Philadelphia, <laughs> because the Free Library needs your support for all of the programs, but particularly the programs focused on the children. So if you want, when you write a check, put in the legend that you want it to go to support the children's programs, because we have to have our children make up the time that they lost during COVID. Three, support the Free Library by getting involved in, in politics, talking to your elected officials and telling them how important the branches of the Free Library are as they serve our citizens throughout this wonderful city. And four, buy this book, <laughs> Age of the Revolutions by Fareed Zakari. Now, I'm going to borrow a phrase from our distinguished guests. Here's my take. In my judgment, he is a living example of why we need to support immigration. Fareed is an immigrant from India. He is a secular Muslim. He came and got an AB degree from Yale and a PhD from Harvard. But more importantly, he has stayed in America and he has enriched our lives by the impact that he's had in terms of providing information and providing perspective about the values that I think we all hold as near and important to support. Now, this book, the theme of it is about the progress and backlash, the action and reaction that has taken place over time. But here's a little clue. If you don't have a lot of time after you get the book, be sure and read the last chapter. <laughs> because the last chapter, The Infinite Abyss is the title, but it has two sections that are very important and for Reed provides his perspective to what is it to be done and faith in freedom. Now, he also has a quote in his book that I think is really, to me, what's at the essence and what I pray nightly will prevail. At the end of the day, most countries and most people strive for peace and stability. May it be so. Please give a wonderful Philadelphia welcome to Dr. Fareed Sakari and read his book. Thank you so much. It is a huge pleasure to be here. I'm a big fan of the city and uh, it was so wonderful to get that incredibly warm introduction from Morris. Um, I feel like Organizations like these are the kind of things that Alexis de Tocqueville must have seen when he came to America in the 1820s and 30s and wrote Democracy in America. And if you remember, one of the, the, the key insights and observations that he has uh, when traveling around the United States was that Americans were very unusual, he said, in that if there was a town in which they didn't have a a public library, they wouldn't wait for the government to set one up. They just set one up themselves. And if they felt like they wanted an orchestra, why they would find a way to found an orchestra. And he described these as these voluntary groups as intermediate associations because they existed between the family and the state. And his point was that Europe had very few of those kind of bottom up intermediate organizations, and that's what gave American self-government such richness and resonance. And I think that's still true to this day, that there's something very distinctive about America in that the capacity for self-organization, for self-government, for taking on these kinds of problems and trying to solve them 
is a distinctive feature that you still, you know, one still marvels at. Like the great art galleries in the United States are all was set up by citizens of New York or Philadelphia or Chicago, uh, whereas the art gal the great art galleries in Europe are the palaces of the king with his private collection, which at some point they, they were forced to turn into <laughs> turn into public galleries, uh, and that's you know that's one of the the great joys of being in America. So, you know, thank you because what, by supporting all this, you support a very old and important American tradition. Um, I thought what I'd do, and this is a little unusual because uh, you are all people who were here. And you have very kindly already bought the book. So what I don't want to do is for you to go back home and start reading the book and say, well, he said that. He said that. He said that. So I'm not going to recite the kind of, you know, the narrative arc of the book. What I'm going to do is talk about the, how the themes of the book um, influence what's going on today. You know, how did I come to write this book and what does it tell us about today? And I... I don't do that much of, of that in the book because I want the book to stand as a kind of historical accounting of how we got here. And uh, I, I leave it to you, in a sense, to, to form your own conclusions about where we should go, though, as Morris very kindly said, the, the last chapter, which I am very fond of, uh, is trying to point us, and in, in, it points to, I think, the central psychological problem that each of us have to resolve for ourselves and, w and where we go. Um, I started to think about this book because I noticed about 10 years ago, and that's when I started working on this book, I noticed that American politics, something seems seemed to be going haywire. And something seemed to be going haywire in a way that was un different from previous times. It wasn't just that you had political turmoil or you had political divisions. You know, we had political divisions over the Vietnam War, over Watergate. There was something else going on. And the first thing I noticed was the rise of the Tea Party, which was this very bizarre group which came up uh, determined n mostly to overthrow the Republican Party itself. It was a, it was a kind of insurgency within the Republican Party and its greatest enemies were the re Republican establishment. Uh, and what I came to realize that th w was that it was largely a movement motivated and animated by a sense of kind of deep, deep discontent and deep opposition to the way America was, uh, you know, today, modern day America. They, they, their rhetoric was often about low taxes and and low and and uh, and, and uh, railing against big government well, there was a very interesting book by Theda Scotchpool a scholar at Yale who kind of analyzed it and talked to them and g did survey data and spent you know i think it was a year and a half with them and she came to the conclusion that their animating concerns actually had nothing to do with economics they were all about race multiculturalism immigration that it was a kind of cultural reaction to modern America. And it was not an accident that it was taking place and perhaps was triggered by the arrival of the first African-American president and the first African-American family in the White House. And that reality, that, that, that sort of sense that there was something going on that felt more cultural began to, you know. I then notice something else, which I've talked about on the program in the last couple of weeks, which is the strongest predictive uh, um, results of polling for the last 50 years uh, with regard to the presidential elections has always been people's uh, sense of where the economy was. If people thought the economy was doing well, the president had high approval ratings, tended to get reelected. If they thought the other way, didn't didn't work out so well. Um, and yet, that connection seemed to be breaking down. O Obama presided over the best recovery uh, for any major country in the world uh, since, the, since the 2008 financial crisis. Everyone went down. But the US came out of it somewhat slow at, at, at first, but very steadily. And by the end of it, roaring. The stock market tripled under, under Barack Obama. His approval ratings barely budged. 
The people who liked him liked him, and the people who disliked him disliked him. Interestingly, by the way, the same helped for Donald Trump. Trump, as you remember, until COVID, was presiding over a pretty good economy. His approval ratings were terrible. They were the lowest approval ratings of any modern president. And so then you think that that's Trump, right? But then Biden has had the same experience. Uh, again, post-COVID, the U.S. has come out of post-COVID better than any economy in the world. And yet, Barack Obama's uh, approval, um, uh, Joe Biden's approval ratings don't change much. In fact, for a while, people said, well, it's because of inflation and it's because, you know, people's perceptions are, are, are lagging behind. Well, for the last 18 months, the consumer uh, sentiment has been shooting up as the economy has been doing well. But Biden's approval ratings have, have plateaued. So all of this began to make me think there's something going on that we're, we aren't completely understanding, you know? Um, and it made me realize that something is changing about politics. And if you look at Brexit, and if you look at the rise of po populism in Europe, and the rise of populism in, uh, in other countries, Turkey, uh, where, where Erdogan is a, a very similar kind of figure that Trump and Viktor Orban, uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, um, and even in their own ways, characters like Xi Jinping and Putin and Modi in India, all seem to gain their strength from two or three common features. They all rail against a kind of overeducated urban cosmopolitan elite whom they say have been running the country. Uh, and they stand in opposition to those, to those people and stand for the real Americans, the real Hungarians, the real Turks, the real Indians. You know, this, is a, this was a common theme of Putin in every, in every presidential effect. He represented the heartland, not the Moscow, St. Petersburg elite. And the second was a kind of opposition to many of the aspects of the modern world that were largely not about, again, about economics. It was about multiculturalism. It was about uh, diversity. It was about sexual and gender freedoms of various kinds. So that there was something going on where there was, a, it was a, again, a kind of a cultural reaction to what has been going on in the world for the last 20, 30, 40 years. And it really made me come to realize that this is a kind of revolution uh, in terms of uh, uh, the way we think about politics. And I started to ask myself, okay, when have we seen similar revolutionary periods in the past, and what causes them, and how do they go? That's the, that was why I, I began working on this book. And I went back to some fam familiar uh, 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 periods in history, of course, the French Revolution and things like that. But I realized that I really had to, to start where, where the story of modern politics all really begins, which is the Netherlands. The, believe it or not, this small little country uh, in, in nestled in, in uh, Northern Europe, invented in many senses modern politics and economics. Before that, politics was kings and courts. And the Dutch are the first great merchant republic. Uh, and they become a merchant republic because uh, unlike the great landed estates that dominated France and Spain, they were a plucky little band of people who had to cooperate and work together to find a way to create arable land, of which there was almost none. All of the Netherlands was swampland, so they had to reclaim the land. You know, so it's the difference almost between the trust fund kids and the real scrappers. And the Netherlands were the real scrappers who had to find a way to make this all work. Um, and they become the richest country in the world, uh, the leading technological power in the world. And by the way, have had a pretty good run. For 500 years, they have stayed among the you know, the 10, 15 richest countries in the world. And when you look at the Human Development Index that the UN has uh, put out, they're always in the top, they've been in the top 10 ever since uh, they, they, uh, the, that index was invented. Even today, the largest agricultural exporter in the world is the United States of America. The second largest agricultural exporter in the world is Netherlands, with 17 million people. Think about that. Um, so. It's a, it's a pretty remarkable run. 
And so I go from there and look at you know, the great failed revolution of the French Revolution, the great successful revolution of the, uh, the Industrial Revolution, which really is the mother of all revolutions. And the simple argument of the book is that whenever you have periods of intense economic and technological transformation, which are you know, massive accelerations, uh, with the Dutch, it was the invention of tall ships which allowed for globalization, the invention of the, the first uh, you know, kind of real multinational company. It was called a joint stock company, the Dutch East India Company, which was uh, the largest company in the world uh, at the time, the invention of stock markets, all those kind of financial innovations. Some country that manages to adapt to them well moves forward. That process accelerates. Technological change accelerates. But then you get two things happen. One, you always get an identity revolution that goes along with it. So as the Dutch start to do well, they start to think of themselves not as Catholic subjects of the Habsburg Empire, but instead as independent, not Catholic, not, uh, not Habsburgs. They think of themselves as Dutch, they think of themselves as Protestant, and they think of themselves as independent. And that's what ma makes them break away and create the first you know, uh, independent merchant republic in, in, uh, in Europe. The, 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 the Venetians, is a, I talk about it in the book, there's a small coda about Venice, which was a, a kind of an early uh, effort in the same direction. But then you get the second thing after the identity revolution that inevitably comes out of all this is you get a backlash. And you get a backlash of people who say, stop this train, I want to get off. Stop the world, I want to get off. And you have politicians who, believe it or not, in the 16th century in Holland were promising to take you back to the good old days <laughs> before all this was happening. This, by the way, is a very familiar theme in Western history. You can, you can read the poems of Horace in ancient Rome, and he's decrying, oh, tempora, oh, mores, things have gotten so bad, the kids nowadays, and, and promising to take you back and you know, to make Rome great again. Um, because there's always this, you know, nostalgia-fueled politics that promises to take you back to some Edenic period that actually never existed. You know, I, 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 I saw a quote from Nikki Haley at one point where she says, oh, if only we could go back to, the, to, to when we were young, when politics was so much, life was so much simpler and politics was so much easier. Tucker Carlson the other day was talking about how, oh, you know, if only our cities could be the way they were when I was growing up, they've all gotten terrible. Now, both Nikki Haley and, and, and uh, Tucker are about the same age as I am, and so it means they're talking about basically the 1970s. Now, the 1970s in the United States are the period where we are losing the first major war we've ever lost in our lives. The president is being impeached because of actual criminal conduct in the Oval Office. There were riots taking place in 100 American cities, all the follow-on of the assassinations of two of our most important political leaders. Uh, economically, we were mired in something no economist had ever seen before, let alone knew how to cure it, stagflation, a combination of stagnation and inflation. And in Europe, you had uh, you know, assassinations of, of, of leaders like the Prime Minister of Spain, uh, the 1968 riots that took place all over Europe, and so you're thinking to yourself, and by the way, the cities that Tucker Carlson so fondly remembers were, as you will all remember, in the worst shape they've been in 100 years. New York City declared bankruptcy in 1975. So it, it requires a very selective memory to, 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 to remember those, those, those halcyon days before it all went, uh, went apart. Um, but that theme recurs. And it made me realize that we are in one of those, those kinds of periods. And, we are, we have, and, and you can tell how revolutionary the, the period is by how much the politics have changed. You know, to put it very simply, and, and I think Tony Blair uh, came up with this, uh, this idea, that we're really moving from a politics of left versus right to a polit politics of open versus closed. You know, do you, do you, do you like the world that is open, open to, you know, trade, immigration, diversity, multiculturalism, you know, women's uh, emancipation, the o opportunities for minorities of all kinds, or do you look at that world with suspicion and want to put, 
you know, blocks on it, tariffs, protections, immigration controls, less diversity, less multiculturalism. And so it made me think about when did, you know, how, when did we get, uh, get that debate about left versus right in the first place? And I will tell you one story that's in the book because it's one of my favorites. Um, so the reason we talk about left wing and right wing, left uh, of center, right of center, is all because of an architect in Paris in the 1780s. The basic story of the French Revolution is the king wanted more money to, to, to uh, spend on wars. He wanted to get the parliament to come in and, and agree to authorize taxes. The parliament said no and instead deposed the king. That's my two-line version of the, of the French Revolution. So when the king <clears throat> calls the Estates General, as it was then called, it was, he was calling them into intercession for the first time in 175 years. That is how centralized and, and uh, auto, uh, autocratic the king of France and then the French monarchy had become. They gather in Versailles in a room in which they sat according to their social status. The uh, clergy on the right, the nobility on the left, and the commoners way at the back. And th those three groups, by the way, had equal weighting in the voting, even though the first represented half a percent of the French population, the other one, the other half of a percent, and the, the commoners were 99% of the French population. But they were, you know, three equal bodies, as it were. Um, and what starts to happen is the, 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 the estates general said, no, we're not going to rubber stamp this, and the commoners obviously most, most vociferously opposed. And what begins to happen, one of the, the barons there writes in his diary that we just, through a natural process of, uh, of uh, camaraderie and fellow feeling, those of us who supported the king started to congregate and cluster and sit more on the right-hand side of the chair of the presiding officer. And the people who were critical of the king started to sit at the left-hand side of the chair. They then moved the Estates General, which has by then uh, declared itself the National Assembly. They move it to Paris. But they don't have a place in Paris. I mean, the king has a nice place in Paris called the Louvre. But they, they don't have a place. So for those of you who, who've been in the Tuileries, they, they found a room that they gave to the National Assembly. And they appointed this architect, Pierre Adrien Paris, to design it. And he found that he could accommodate the maximum number of people if he used the box-like shape and put people in two, in two rows, sets of rows, facing each other. But even then, there was no implication, as there is now in the British House of Parliament, uh, House of Commons, that you had to be, it was open seating. But what starts to happen is a follow-on, a carryover from the Versailles situation. All those who ended up eventually wanting to depose the French monarchy sat on the left-hand side, and all the people who wanted to support the French monarchy sat on the right-hand side. And so for 250 years, we talk of left of center and right of center because of this architectural happenstance that could have gone completely differently. Uh, and I think it's fascinating to think about how that has stayed for so long. And it morphed, you know. Initially, it was it meant you were for a monarchy or for or against a monarchy. Then it began to mean you were for um, uh, uh, church involvement, you know, an official established church in a, in a country and, or not. Um, you know, there was that big debate that takes place in Britain in the 19th century about whether or not the Church of England should be the established church. You know, if you think about King Charles, he is, his second title is he's King, of, uh, King of, uh, of Britain and defender of the faith. And defender of the faith means he is the head of the Anglican church. But there was a big debate in the 19th century with people on the left of center saying, this is terrible, we, shouldn't, we, should, we, we want to be open to all religions. And th th you know, it created this whole uh, 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 controversy and produced one of my favorite words in the English language. So the people who wanted to maintain the Church of England were called the establishmentarians. And the people who want, didn't want that were called the disestablishmentarians. And then there were the anti-disestablishmentarians. Um, and so that is the longest uh, non-scientific word in the English language. Uh, um, that, that, that was a bit of a digression. But in the 20th century, left versus right came to mean what we think of it as. 
you know, it centered around people's views of the economy. And it centered around whether you wanted more government or less government involved. Those on the left wanted more government, more regulation, uh, more taxation, more redistribution. Those on the right wanted the opposite. And if you think about it, that, you know, all of us probably grew up with that understanding. If you think about Ronald Reagan's Republican Party, right, this, or that was essentially the way in which the Republican Party thought. It was, you know, we want to have um, less government, less regulation. We want to have less government spending. Even though Reagan never did it, he kept talking about cutting Social Security and Medicare and balancing the budget and things like that. Uh, and abroad, it was a very... Uh, forward-leaning policy, spread democracy around the world, uh, free trade. And Reagan was, of course, very pro-immigration. He's the one who signs the 1986 amnesty bill. If you look at Donald Trump's agenda, what you realize is on almost every important issue, he is at the opposite place that Ronald Reagan was. He wants tariffs and protections. He wants restrictions on immigration. He hates the idea of the United States having an engaged role abroad. And he particularly hates the idea of us supporting democracies abroad. When, when having to choose between supporting a democracy, Ukraine, or supporting its aggressor, the dictatorship of Russia, you know, you, while we have a sense that Trump's preferences are actually exactly the opposite of what Ronald Reagan's would have been. So that's what I mean when I say it's all gotten scrambled up. You know? and, even, and even on things like Social Security and Medicare, Trump has very famously said, I'm not going to touch them. Uh, you know. Uh, far, far away from the old establishment Republican position. So all of that made me realize the old left-right divide, divide is gone. So, we, you know, what has replaced it? And this is what I spend less time uh, in the book talking about explicitly, and I want to just draw out some of those themes for us today. Well, I think that what has happened is we have moved from a politics that is fundamentally about economics to a politics that's fundamentally about four C's, community, class, culture, and communication. And that's what defines our politics today, these four C's. And I used to think that my first C was capitalism, because clearly the way capitalism has worked over the last 30 or 40 years is a big part of this story. You know. We've, we've had a kind of turbocharged capitalism with globalization that has, in many ways, had a huge impact on, on America. But the more I've looked at it and the more I look at the data, I realize, you know, the United States has done pr pretty well in this period. Um, for, give you a simple example. Uh, in 2008, the Eurozone economy, you know, th those countries in Europe that have adopted the Euro, and the U.S. economy were the same size. 2008, right after the financial crisis. Today, the US economy is twice the size of the Eurozone economies. To give you a sense of how we compare against what you would think of as a rich European country, if Gr Great Britain were to join the United States and become the 51st state, it would be the 51st poorest state in America. It has a per capita income below Mississippi. So. When you think about how we have navigated this period of 30 years of capitalism and globalization, look, you know, we, we, you, can, you can compare, as, as, as Biden says, you can compare yourself to the almighty or you can compare yourself to the alternative. Um, if you ask yourself, compared to other major economies, how has the United States done? And it's, you know, it's done remarkably well. But there is no question there has been an enormous amount of transformation in this economy. Because we have really more fully embraced than almost any other country the post-industrial digital economy. We invented it, we are lead, the world leaders in it, but we have also, as a result, embraced it more than anyone else. And what that fundamentally means is the old economy that we lived with and we all were familiar with, there was, a, there was a great value to people who move things around physically with their hands, steel workers, iron workers, coal miners, car assembly. Today, the economy fundamentally rests on people who move words, computer code, symbols, images, ideas in a virtual space. 
If you think about almost every job, my guess is that your kids have, they are in some way involved that. You know, they're either in computers or in consulting or in banking or in, or in graphic design or in, you know, any of those areas where you're moving images, code, words, symbols, that's, that's the new economy. And those are the people who make much more money than the people who move physical objects with their hands. And that has transformed the United States and it has also resulted in a kind of winner-take-all economy where the, the largest amount of economic growth comes from a small group of cities where everyone clusters. You know, in the old manufacturing economy, you had to be where the, the, the plant was. And the plants were often huge and big and prosperous, and so the towns around them were quite prosperous. Well, but now everyone can move to New York and San Francisco and LA and uh, Cleveland and Chicago, and it's these 20 or 30 big cities that represent everything that is going on dynamically in, 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 uh, in America. 50% of the economic growth in the United States uh, comes from the, I think it's the 20 or 25 largest metropolitan uh, uh, areas in the U.S., and 70% of it comes from the 100 largest cities. Um, but there's a lot of America that those 100 cities don't cover. And that's one of the transformations. But the reason I call it community is because when you look at the data, it's not that people's incomes have gone down. It is true that a certain gr group of people have stagnated, but when you take into account government transfers, Medicare, Social Security, things like that, even their incomes have risen. And it seems to me that's only fair to take into account, but that is the ultimately how those people's, you know, their standard of living is, is based on. But what has happened is they have completely lost their community. So imagine a steel plant in Ohio, Youngstown, Ohio, let's say. The steel plant shuts down for a combination of technology and globalization. There's some part of it moves to, uh, to South Korea or to China. And the people, as I say, the data shows do end up getting jobs and sometimes they have to work two jobs and two part-time jobs, but, they're, but they're, they're still making money. They're still doing fine. But what has gone away is the whole life around that steel plant. So there was a Rotary Club or a Kiwanis Club that was part of it. There was a bowling league that was part of it. They used to all go to church, but because there aren't those communities and that peer, peer pressure, there's much less church att attendance. They used to all gather at the, at the uh, local hardware store. Well, Home Depot has taken care of that. They used to go to the movies. Well, Netflix has taken care of that. There were a bunch of other stores they would go to. Amazon has taken care of that. So what you end up with is a kind of life in which you're, you're rich, you're free, you're living in America, but you're alone. And that loss of community, I think, is at the heart of what explains a lot of what's going on. But it's not the only thing. It's not the only C. I think what also has happened then is that makes you pray to concerns and fears about change. And the change that you can see is not abstract things like information technology and global capital flows and things like that. Those are the things we talk about when we study these things. What people can see is the visible face of all this change, and that's people who look different, who sound different, who maybe worship different gods. And so the, the reaction becomes one about culture. And it becomes, first, I want to keep these people out. And secondly, I want to preserve my, the, the culture I have, the culture I know. And there begins to be this extreme anti-immigrant feeling and also this extreme possessiveness about, about culture. You know, why are they teaching these books at this school? Why aren't they teaching the books that, they were, that were taught when I was a kid? You know, and, and the battle lines become about these cultural issues. If you listen to... Republican politicians like Ron DeSantis. You know, again, he, when, when he was running against, for the brief period when he was running against uh, Trump, he, he didn't talk much about economics, even though he's run Florida quite well as a governor, and he handled Florida quite well under COVID. But he doesn't even want to take credit for that. What he wants to talk about is how Disney is too woke, 
how school children, uh, school kids are being taught a multicultural math, whatever that may be. Um, you know about how he's going to make sure that, that, that you know that that, that uh, Texas, uh, that Florida is immigrant free, which is a kind of hilarious idea when you think about Fl Florida. But but you know he's the guy who starts shipping all those all those uh, people to, on flights to Martha's Vineyard. Uh, but you see what I mean? That that's where and look, he's obviously done good polling and good focus groups, and that's where the action, that's where the energy is. That's what he was trying to appeal to, because it is this cultural. This, this cultural battle line that has become the one that for a certain part of the public is, a, is very, very real and very, very threatening. And if you want to look at um, you know, what, one of the reasons why this is happening now, very fascinating thing about, about the United States is that we've been a rich country for a while, for a long time. But our values have remained very traditional compared to other rich countries. So there's this thing called the World Values Survey, in which they plot where countries sit on, I'm going to put it very simply on the three Gs, gays, guns, and God. And the United States was always this anomaly that is that we were a very, very rich country, but on those values, we were closer to Nigeria than to Denmark. And in the last 15 years, something has shifted. The United States has experienced, this is all out of a wonderful set of surveys by a scholar named Ronald Inglehart. Uh, the United States has dropped in religiosity more than any country in the world in the last 15 years. That's church attendance, that's people saying whether or not they're religious, that's people saying you know, what's called the nuns when people are asked, uh, what what religion do you believe in? The number of people who say none, in, in N O N E, not N U N, uh, has gone up dramatically. And I think that this is at the heart of understanding part of this this cultural backlash, this cultural reactionary. Uh, because you know, when you lose that sense of faith, when you lose one of the oldest things that moored you, that anchored you. Uh, it, it's very unsettling. It's, very, it's, it's, it's something that people find very difficult to make sense of, and that's what's happening here. But the third C is equally important because that's class. You know, I mentioned, and we don't talk a lot, a lot about class in America. I mentioned um, that everywhere people seem opposed to this multicultural, cosmopolitan, overeducated elite. The fascinating thing about this is that's the one thing that unites left-wing populism and right-wing populism. So if you look in Latin America over the last three or four years, most of the elections have been won by populists, but they're all left-of-center populists. But they all share in common this belief that the country has been run by these technocrats, you know, urban elites who don't understand the country and are out of touch with it. So that is the common theme. And I think that relates to the economic discussion I was talking about, where people are basically finding that there's something going on in the big cities uh, where all the power is now concentrated, all the uh, talent is concentrated, all the capital, finance is concentrated. I got an email from a guy uh, after Trump won, and I wrote a couple of you know, despairing columns, I suppose would be the accurate way to describe them. And he sends me a, a very thoughtful guy. He was like, I, I love your show. I always uh, watch it. I always read what you ha have to write. But you're trying to understand what it is that we, you know, that we were trying to say when we voted for Trump. Well, let me try to explain what my life looks like. I live in a rural part of America. I don't have a college degree. I don't work in one of the new industries. And it is as if I don't exist. He said, when I, when I watch, when I turn the television on, every situation comedy is set in Soho or in, you know, in San Francisco. When I listen to music, it's all music that emanates out of, you know, Harlem or Nashville. Uh, when, I, when I go to the movies, it's the same thing. You know, what he was reflecting was something quite real about American popular culture. It has, it has increasingly become defined and populated by you know the, this 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 new uh, educated urban elite. Think about 
television in your, you know, when you were growing up. And, you know, there was still stuff like Gunsmoke and the hell, the, even the Beverly Hillbillies was about the contrast between those two worlds. Well, we, we no longer think, you know, we don't know where the Hillbillies came from. They now have been assimilated into Beverly Hills and they're, you know, they're, they're drinking lattes and having yoga and, and doing yoga. In fact, I always thought, if you remember when Hillary Clinton had her server scandal, um, she talked about how, you know, she just wanted to have a private place uh, on her calendar where she could you know, schedule her, her yoga appointments. And I always wondered whether that was one of those cases where she had a tin year for what to say, where, where the people were more offended by the private server or the yoga, or the yoga points. You know, because there's a part of this country where people think of yoga as something that's more closer to voodoo than, than to exercise, you know. So they, they, there's that big class difference. And, and it's ironic that Donald Trump is able to be the tribune of the working class or the, or the but, but he is because if they read a very good book by a, 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 a woman sociologist at the University of Berkeley, it was called, I think it was called White Working Class or something like that. And she made the point that you guys don't understand something, it was based on a lot of survey data. You don't understand, you know, working class people. They, they don't mind rich people. They love rich people. They want to get rich themselves. What they despise are educated, professional, urban elites. They don't like the consultants, the lawyers, the bank. They, they love the real estate developer who you know, builds something with his hands and gets rich. And they love because those guys are vulgar, crass. You know, um, they, you know that somebody once said, if you go into Trump, uh, Trump's apartment, that gaudy triplex on Trump Tower, which is you know, gilded with gold, it's sort of faux Louis, Louis the Fifteenth. Uh, that's you know probably what uh, you know a working class person's fantasy of of you know of of true wealth is. That's the that's the suite at Vegas you check into if you get lucky at the slot machines, and in a in a very real way, Trump was always able to to to, to sort of connect at that level, that aspirational level, in a way that you know. The, the fancy lawyers and, and bankers don't because they look at those people with, with you know, each side looks at the other with a certain uh, condescension, uh, ironically. And that culture, that class element to this is, I think, very important to understand. When you listen to Trump supporters, um, what you see is an enormous amount of that class warfare, that sense that we do not want to be run, ruled by you. Um, and, th th and that's happening everywhere. You know, when I, I was in India, and I grew up in India, so I know it well, uh, a couple of months ago, and I noticed that so much of Modi's uh, campaign is about, you know, how he does not come from that elite background. He, he's a simple man, he comes from, under, and he, that's where he draws his strength. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't know the cities, he doesn't know the, the you know, the, the fan, fan, this is a guy who didn't even go to uh, college, right? So. It's a, it's a very sharp contrast he's drawing. Bolsonaro did the same thing in Brazil. And I think that we, we underestimate the role class plays in all of this. And the final C is communication. You know, people will often say to me, why don't we have a media that was like it was when, you know, Dan Rather or Peter Jennings was doing the nightly news and it was straight down the middle and Every, all, you know, Americans were listening. Everyone was watching. You guys now have, you know, nothing like that audience. Maybe you should try to go back to what they were doing. Well, they were doing what they were doing because there were only three channels, right? Every, each channel knew they had tens of millions of people watching, many of whom were Democrats and many of whom were Republicans, many are liberal, many conservative. So they had to be down the middle, not to mention that there were FCC guidelines telling you that you had to... Uh, it do something that's called the Fairness Doctrine. What happened is technology exploded that model and you went from three to 300 channels. And now what's happened is those people who were watching Peter Jennings and Dan Rather, they're not watching news anymore. They, they're watching ESPN. They're watching Bravo. They're watching you know, all kinds of different alt options that they have increasingly on demand. Right? Think about um, how much of the television you now watch, you watch when you want, the show you want. 
that's a whole different world. And now the people who are watching television news are the junkies, are the people who are passionately interested in news. Well, guess what? They are passionate. They're not down the middle. They're not sort of unsure of how they stand. They're committed, either on the right or on the left. Right? So what you're left with are the people who are watching and following, who are the people who are the most active, the most animated, and the media gives those people what they want. You know, when people tell me, why do you put so much of X on, it's not like it's my decision for all of CNN, but my point would be just to remember one thing. American media is a for-profit enterprise in a very competitive market in a capitalist country. If we're putting something on there, chances are you want it. There's, you know, nobody is doing public charity here. The, the stuff that is going on the airwaves is stuff that people want. I don't mean you specifically, but there is a market for what people, you know, and that's what, frankly, was Roger Ailes' great genius when he founded Fox, was he realized there was an underserved market of a whole bunch of people frustrated by these liberal elites who wanted to hear a different version of what was going on. And that, that communications revolution is the overriding reason why we are where we are. Now, having said that about all these four Cs, I think it takes us to a very bad place politically. Um, I, 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 you know, I can, I can analyze why we got here, but I am not neutral as to what the effect of this is. The effect has been to create a highly polarized, dysfunctional political system where we, we cannot you know, raise the debt ceiling. We cannot pass budget resolutions. We can't get ordinary business done. Uh, you know, Supreme Court uh, appointments get held up for years so that the other party has a chance to win, which is unprecedented in, in American history. And of course, we have the, the first time in American history that a sitting president tried to prevent the peaceful transfer of power. Uh, and more importantly, actually was able to pressure a majority of House Republicans to vote not to certify a peaceful transfer power, not to certify a duly authorized election by 50 states that went up to 56 court cases, all of which went against uh, the, the, uh, the, the challenger, uh, Trump. And yet, a majority of House, forget what happened outside you know, the Capitol in, on January 6th, what happened inside is the scandal that you had a majority of the House Republicans. If, if it had been a Republican majority, you, we would have had literally the, the, the decertification of a free and fair election. All of this is terrible for American democracy. Um, and, and that's why I've tried to spend so much time trying to understand what are the historical parallels, where do we go. And look, I, I, I come out of it with, with considerable optimism. But you have to take a long perspective. I started in 1600 for a reason, you know. You, you come to realize that this kind of change is very dramatic, very revolutionary, that it does unsettle people, that it does unmoor people. But at the end of the day, there's no path but forward, you know. You can't really go back. There is no back to go back to. When people talk about going back, you know, they're conveniently forgetting that many of those periods, you know, women were not allowed to be doctors and lawyers. Immigrants were seen not, not you know, not heard. Blacks were still second-class citizens. Uh, the economy was rigid and controlled by a bunch of, uh, you know, large companies. Uh, you had much less of the flexibility, the openness, the freedom that we have today. So there isn't any going back. There is a question of how you navigate through all of this going forward. And that's where I think we have to... That, that's where we have to kind of understand it better. And one of the things I, I do think, look, the greatest threat to our liberal democracy comes from this populist right. There's no question. It is a existential threat. To me, that's w what the stakes of this election are. I, I honestly wish Biden had not run. I wish a year ago he had stepped down and allowed for a full uh, democratic uh, uh, um, primary, which would have, you know, energized the grassroots and brought out a lot of very talented people. You know, 
The Democrats have a very interesting, there was a bunch of really interesting senators, a bunch of really interesting governors. Um, I, 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 I've been told privately a couple of generals uh, who are interested, you know, so you can imagine who, who they might be. But we are where we are. We have one um, somewhat elderly man who is very wise, I can tell you having spent a little time with him myself. He's a wise, thoughtful guy who's been a good president. Um, but is, you know, beyond his prime. Um, and you have a man who is an existential threat to American democracy, you know? And to me, it doesn't even seem like it's close, right? It's, uh, I mean, whatever you may think of Biden, at the end of the day, we can, I can very confidently say he is going to allow the peaceful transfer of power. He's not going to politicize the military. He's not going to politicize the Justice Department. He's not going to try and politicize the bureaucracy. And it feels to me like those are stakes in which even if you want your taxes to be a little lower or you want regulation to be a little different, these, these pale in comparison to the stakes of that, that existential struggle. But if, you know, I think at the end of the day, we are likely to get past this because Trump in particular is not really a political movement. It's a personality cult. The last Republican convention, 2020, the Republican Party had no platform for the first time in its history. Do you know what the platform of the Republican Party was? A one paragraph statement saying, whatever Donald Trump says is the platform of the Republican Party. Not a single former president who was Republican nor presidential nominee of the Republican Party was even invited to the convention. Instead, five members of the Trump family had prime time speaking slots. This is not a political party, you know, this is a family cult. And egregious as that is, that gives me some hope that at the end of the day, this is not an institutionalized movement. That you know, Trump is also 79. Uh, so this is not, you know, th 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 there is going to be a post-Biden world, but also most importantly, a post-Trump world. And I, I myself doubt that anyone else, uh, you know, I don't think that the son or the daughter is going to be able to carry forward this. They, 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 they can't fake it, you know. They're, they're, Trump was, it, in his own weird, bizarre way, had a connection, has a connection with these people. I don't think Donald Trump Jr. grew up on, you know, 57th Street and 5th Avenue has quite the same, that same connection. So at least that is my hope. Now, somebody asked me, I gave a speech, uh, I gave a commencement speech in 2012 uh, at Duke where I was very hopeful and said, well, are you still hopeful? Um, well, let me, let me put it this way, um, and this is what I'll, I'll close with and then take your questions. As I started by talking about how America is done compared to others, it's, it actually goes even beyond that. You know, one of the things I learned in, in the book is that economic historians believe that the, the, the key, the defining power of the, of, the, of the age is always the one that leads furthest and, and, and most dramatically in technology. It's always been true in history. And it points out this great historian, Angus Madison, that there have only been three dominant players in technology in the world. It was the, ne the Netherlands for the first 150 years of modern history, then the British for another 150 years, and then the United States. If you look at America today, we dominate the 21st century technologically more than we ever had, more than any country ever has. Every technology that you can think of, the US is, is the com in the commanding heights of. If you had looked at the world in 1975, 85, and you had said, what are the leading technology companies in the world, right? You would have said some, some American, but some Japanese for sure, the Mitsubishis of the world, the, the Toyotas, some, some Dutch, Philips, some German, Siemens, and things like that. Today, when you look at the great technology companies of the world, they're all American. And not only are they all American, they so dominate the world that it's actually slightly scary. The seven largest technology companies in the United States, which are the seven largest technology companies in the world, have a combined market capitalization that is larger than the total stock market capitalization of the countries of Canada, Britain, France, and Germany put together. Apple's market cap is larger than that of the entire German stock exchange. 
And Germany is the third richest country in the world, right? So that's how well we're doing at, at, and, you know, in terms of hard power. We're producing on energy at a scale that nobody has ever seen uh, a rich country do before. We, may, we produce more oil than Saudi Arabia. We produce more natural gas than Qatar. And we are increasingly in the lead of every green technology, thanks to Biden's IRA. We are increasingly the solar, wind, geothermal leaders in the world. You look at our financial system. Despite having had 08, our banks have come out of it better than any others and dominate the world. The dollar continues to be the currency, the currency of the world. And finally, unlike every other rich country in the world, we're demographically vibrant. This is a huge problem for most of the leading economic powers in the world. China is in dem demographic collapse. But Europe is all, I mean, every European country looks like Florida. I, I don't mean aesthetically. <laughs> they, would be, they would be horrified at that prospect. I, 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 I mean demographically. These, they're all basically turning into retirement states. And we remain uh, vibrant because of immigration, by the way. Our, our actual uh, fertility rate is the same as Europe's. But we take in legally, totally legally, one million people a year. Um, and that is more than the rest of the industrialized world does uh, put together. And we know how to assimilate these people. And, we're, and you know, the truth is the forward movement is real. We are moving forward on all these fronts with energy, with confidence. We're building a new kind of country, a universal nation that draws from all the, the uh, parts of the world, and not just all the parts of the world, but tells all the people in this country, you can be yourself. You don't have to conform to somebody else's idea and ideal of who you are. You can be exactly who you want to be, and you can achieve whatever you need to, whatever you want to, whether you're a woman, whether you're black, whether you're brown, whether you're uh, gay, bi uh, bisexual, lesbian, whatever. That's hard, you know, it's unsettling, it's unnerving, it's much more difficult than having some leader tell you this is the, this is the you know, the received uh, uh, orthodoxy and follow it. But it's incredibly exhilarating and I think we will get through these, these, these difficult times, but you have to fight for it. You know, I think one mistake that people who are on the more, uh, who are in favor of progress tend to make is they think that it's, it's all gonna happen. There's a kind of fatalism. But it's not gonna happen if you don't fight for it. It's not gonna happen if you don't get out there and, and make it happen. You know, you can, have, you can have detours, you can have backlashes, you can, have, you can spend a long time going backwards. Look at a country like Iran, which has been going backwards for 35 years. Look at North Korea. Look at Russia now, which is destined to, I think, spend decades going backwards. So, you know, you have to, you have to move forward and you have to try to, try to make sure that you're, you're winning the battles you need to. You're persuading people. You're not, you're not condescending to them. You're persuading them. But I think we will be able to do that and I think that if I'm given a chance to give a commencement address 10 or 15 years from now, I will be able to be equally optimistic. Thank you all very much.